Now that's a lot of work. I can personally confirm that the bees are some of the hardest working little creatures out there in the garden, and without them, there wouldn't be a garden. As critical pollinators, bees are responsible for pollinating 70 of the 100 crops that the majority of the world's population depends on for food. But as important as they are, they are not the only beneficial bugs that you want to call your garden home. From how to attract the ones you want and keep away the ones you don't, we're going in depth with the good, the bad, and the buggy. There's so many different ways to grow edibles or vegetables and herbs. You know, some gardeners, if they've got a lot of space, they love to create long rows where they segregate the different varieties and keep them separated. And that's one way to do it. And then others like to mix it up. You know, a little of this, a little of that, where they all intertwine. It's just another approach. Edibles are so versatile. Most will grow in a wide variety of conditions. The possibilities are frankly endless when you know what you're doing. You see with this resurgence of growing your own food, mixing edibles with ornamental flowers is more appealing, especially if you have limited space. Hey Angel, how you doing? You taking a break? You see, just about anything you can grow in the garden, you can grow in containers, which makes it really handy just outside the kitchen door. Here I've created a theme garden, a tea garden, using aromatic herbs like lavender, a couple of types of mint. This is chocolate mint and sweet mint. Over here I have lemon balm and rosemary. You can create other types of themed gardens. And no matter what theme you choose, I always recommend that you use larger containers and always go for dwarf or patio varieties of vegetables when you can. They just work better in smaller spaces. There are also practical reasons for mixing edibles with more ornamental flowers in your garden. You see, it's all about diversity. Flowering plants attract pollinating and beneficial insects, so having them close to your edibles increases the chances of these little workers lending a hand. The main thing to do is just have some fun and get creative with the space you have. For instance, I'm using the railing on this deck to help support this tomato plant. Hey, it works. Another great place to think about using edibles in your landscape is along a path as a border, like I've done here with parsley. You can use curly parsley. Here I've planted it directly in the ground or you can use flat leaf Italian and containers that dot along the path. Some other plants that I love to use as border plants include strawberries, blueberries, and if you're looking for a ground cover, why not think about using oregano or thyme? Now you just wanna remember the conditions of your site. Most of these plants need six hours of sun each day. They require consistent moisture. And if you focus on herbs, one of the great things about them is many of them are drought tolerant. No matter what size garden you have, it's just more efficient to mix the herbs, vegetables, and flowers. And hey, not only do you get the beauty, but you get great tasting flavor. Mm-hmm, you're a good tasting basil. Nice. Four months ago, we had some baby ducks delivered here to the farm, five different breeds. Yeah, five, can you believe it? And among them were these Indian runners. Oh, we got all kinds. We got the white crested duck, we got blue Swedish, black kuagas. But these Indian runners are really, really amusing. They walk like penguins. They're very vertical, aren't you, my dear? This is Edna. She's one of the girls that's growing up with the whole flock. And we have a whole flock because they're excellent for eating bugs. Hey, you wanna take care of bugs in your garden? Why spray chemicals? Get some Indian runners, right? What are some of your favorite bugs to eat? Slugs, snails, spiders. That's what she's saying. You see, I speak duck. Anyway, these Indian runners were bred in Southeast Asia to go out into the fields, mainly rice fields, and eat insects. So I think they're great for the small farm or backyard for insect control. They're really funny to watch. These birds are flat out comical. Now, they're not very large. The little hen ducks, this is a hen here, and she weighs about four pounds. The drakes may get up to five, maybe five and a half, and that's it. And they're great egg layers, aren't you? Yeah, they produce eggs like you cannot believe. Now, what they're not good at is getting broody and to sit on the eggs and hatch ducklings. So what we may have to do is take some of Edna's eggs that are fertilized 
and put them under a surrogate mom in the way of a Muscovy duck or another duck or even a chicken hen or put them in the incubator. Is that okay? She liked that. She says she's a working mom. When it comes to caring for these ducks, they're really easy. When you put them in the garden, you want to make sure that they can't get out and run around the neighbor's yards. That's not a good idea. You also want to make sure they have plenty of water. These ducks love water, but they don't have to have water to play in. If you have water, they will definitely play in it, but they need plenty to drink. When it comes to food, we give them a high protein feed, which they really like. Plus they get all the insects and grass and so forth that they want from their foraging in the garden. You want to make sure that they have a full balanced diet. There's nothing cuter than a baby duck, and they're great for children to raise. But if you're looking for a pet duck, I don't want her to hear this, Indian runners aren't the best because they're pretty high strung and they run around, Ooh, don't hear this. There are other breeds that are bigger, larger, and calmer, a little more docile, better for children. Anyway, Indian runners are a great duck to have because they produce so many eggs and they can take care of your garden and they come in lots of different beautiful colorways. This is one called a fawn white Indian runner. They're white Indian runners that I've raised for years. And they come in all different colors, so check them out. Right, Edna? Yeah, well, you wanna go join the others? Okay, let's go. Go get them, girl. Hi, I'm Bill Lubick and I'm with Rutgers Cooperative Extension in the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. And we're here at our beautiful butterfly house in South Brunswick, New Jersey at the Earth Center. And one thing to remember is that insects can be a great thing for your garden and for your landscape. So it's not always a bad idea to keep insects out. We want to try to invite the good insects into our garden to help us to be able to control a lot of other problems. The most important thing is to have an ecological balance within our landscape and within our garden. So what we try to do here is we try to plant plants that will actually attract all the beneficial insects like yarrow, and you see bronze fennel next to me. All these plants provide an ideal environment to attract beneficial insects and to keep them in the area. So they help us to be able to control some of the deleterious or harmful insects that will do harm to our garden or our landscapes. Having plants that they love, like yarrow, and milkweed, especially if you're going to attract butterflies, uh, and butterfly plants, butterfly weed like Asclepia, flowering plants, the nectar type plants that they're attracted to. It will really bring in a, a wealth of beneficial insects, and kids have a lot of fun identifying moths and butterflies. Some of the things to remember are to provide places where the insects can get shelter, where they can get water, even just having a small container that has some stones in it and some water and refresh that water once in a while. The earlier that you can catch the problem by using the beneficial insects, the greater the chances of success that the beneficials are going to be able to keep up with the harmful insects. If you wait until the problem becomes extremely severe, then you're going to have a problem where the uh, beneficial insects simply can't keep up with the exploding populations of aphids. So if you have environments that are mixed and very diverse, that can really help you in trying to control organically a lot of your pest problems that you may have within your garden and landscape. Looking for a way to repel those nasty biting bugs without soaking yourself in some sort of insect spray? Why not make your own citronella candle?
We all know that there are certain bugs in our gardens that are a real menace, but you can get Mother Nature on your side and employ some of the beneficial insects that can help you win the war against some of those bad bugs. I'm Tim Kring, uh, professor, University of Arkansas Entomology Department. We're at the uh, University of Arkansas's Division of Agriculture uh, Research Farm in Fayetteville. Uh, my specialty is entomology, which is the study of insects. The specific area of my work is with beneficial insects, so insects that eat insects. Often when you're in a garden situation, you want to encourage your beneficial insects and discourage your pests. There are a number of ways to do that. One, people will plant flowering plants to bring in the beneficial insects around their fruit or vegetable gardens, and that's one way you can bring in good insects. You can also purchase insects, uh, and you can purchase things like lady beetles. There's a lot of other natural enemies that you can purchase, little parasitic wasps or predaceous mites that will eat certain other pests and insects, and those are commercially and readily available. We're uh, at the Division of Agricultural's Agricultural Experiment Station in a research plot. Uh, on this plant is a, uh, a common garden pest, aphids. Aphids are known as plant lice also, and if you're a gardener, you know about them. They occur on the bottom sides of leaves and up in the terminal, and sometimes even on your fruit. Most of the damage they cause is by direct feeding, where they reduce the vigor of that plant. They also transmit a lot of diseases to your plant. Aphids are controlled in a variety of ways without insecticides, often without you knowing it. Natural enemies, which is a name we use for beneficial insects, predators, and parasites that attack these aphids and keep their, their numbers lower. One of the most common are, are uh, lady beetles. With lady beetles, there's different kinds of lady beetles. The big red one we're most common with, but there's also little tiny black ones uh, that are lady beetles also. All lady beetles have the same, same biology though. They start with eggs. Eggs are laid on the plant tissue. The common big red ones are a bright lemon yellow egg that are laid on end. They're kind of oblong in a group. And you, you'll commonly see those if you have aphids around. Then the, the eggs hatch into small larvae that look like small alligators. So for example, here we have a larval lady beetle that is up on top of this plant. And it's just like this one here. And these, are of, of a, these, these lady beetle larvae are almost full grown and will soon, soon become inactive and turn into what we call a pupa, a pupal stage. And it's a resting stage where they, they, they become ready to become an adult. So here's a pupa of a lady beetle larva. You can see these in your home garden when you've had a lot of aphids, and these are a good thing, not a bad thing. So leave them alone, and fairly soon they will turn into an adult. And the adult is the lady beetle that you all, that most people know and is real common. This one here, is called the multicolored Asian lady beetle. Uh, and it's considered a pest as well as a beneficial. It's a pest when it invades your home in the spring and the fall, but it's also a beneficial, both as an adult and a larva, feeding on these aphids. Insects are diverse, and they range the whole gamut from very damaging to you and I, to also very beneficial to you and I. And the great majority of insects are really neither. They fall in that middle ground. But the insects also are a critical component in the whole ecosystem. So other, other animals to, uh, live on insects. The plants need the insects. Pollinators come to mind uh, to, to live, uh, that it's a whole universe that, that, uh, that they live in. Just take a look at this drift of Russian sage, one of my favorite plants because it's a perennial and so easy to grow, but it has an added benefit. It is a plant that I use to help support the pollinators here at the farm, specifically bees, honeybees, bumblebees, you name it, because they're so important to our food system. 
But bees have been on the decline lately. So I think we should all be looking at ways to bolster our pollinator population. To get some ideas on how to do this, Richard Underhill gives us the scoop. I'm Richard Underhill. I'm the president of the Arkansas Beekeepers Association. Uh, I'm an EAS certified master beekeeper. Alan invited me to his uh, home at uh, Moss Mountain in Arkansas. It's a beautiful uh, site to, to see the gardens and their connection to the uh, bees and the native pollinators. We have the uh, honeybee as our major pollinator of our food crops, but we also have uh, 30 species of bumblebees, we have carpenter bees, we have 3,000 species of native bees that uh, are also important uh, in pollinating our gardens and our food supply. Through pollination of our food crops, they provide one third of our human diet. One, one bite out of three that goes in our mouth, we can thank the bees uh, for providing it. Bees are, are gentle creatures. Uh, the honeybee uh, is our major uh, pollinator. Uh, it is a stinging insect and it will sting to defend its nest, which is a beehive. Uh, when the bees are out visiting gardens, though they are not interested in uh, stinging people and they're very gentle, it's safe to, to walk around them and have them in your gardens. There are a few families of plants that are particularly attractive to the uh, bees and the native pollinators because they provide uh, f the food in the way of nectar and pollen. Uh, some of these families include the composite family, which is the sunflower family, the, uh, the mustard family, the, uh, the mint family, the legumes and rose families also are very attractive to the um, bees. The uh, pollinated gardens can be any kind of garden. They can be a flower garden, a vegetable garden, your kitchen herb garden. The, the only difference is, is that we uh, plant any plants that we want, but we try to be very prudent in our use of pesticides so that we don't kill the important uh, beneficial insects. Bees and all of the insects uh, do uh, need water. Honeybees in particular take in lots of water into the hive to, uh, for their, their personal metabolism plus uh, for cooling the hive. Uh, we need to provide water uh, for the, uh, uh, all of the pollinators in our pollinator gardens. This can be a, a shallow bowl with some rocks in it to provide a place for the, for the insects to, to climb on. Uh, it, it can be a, a, a waterfall, anything uh, that a person would like to have in the garden. I'm in Alan's vegetable garden. He's planted a um, vegetables and mixed in amongst them uh, companion plantings of marigolds to uh, repel the unwanted insects. And here's some celosia to uh, attract uh, native pollinators and, and bees and other beneficial insects. Having a variety of different plantings brings about a diversity of, of pollinators. Uh, we, we're seeing bees, we're seeing hu honeybees, we're seeing lots of bumblebees today, and many, many species of uh, butterflies. Because the honeybee uh, exhibits flower constancy and uh, continues to uh, go from flower to flower of the same species, it makes it the uh, most effective pollinator of our food crops. Uh, by providing pollinator gardens, we are uh, assisting our bees and our native pollinators uh, in, in providing for our food. We're an, an inherent uh, integral part of our own food supply, as the bees are. Look at all you little guys. Hey, the next time you're considering dealing with a pest problem in your garden, why not enlist some of the little guys? 
Look at these ladybugs. They're great for taking care of aphids and other insects. You know, whether it's increasing pollination, dealing with pests, or even improving your soil, some of these underestimated beneficial insects and microbes can do so much to improve your garden in a natural way. And frankly, it's just a lot of fun. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith. All right, go get them, guys. What a platoon of ladybugs.